As much as half of the world's work is unpaid and most of it is done by women. Indian women do 10 times more unpaid work than men. That is 312 minutes per day for women versus 29 minutes for men. We all are a little responsible here. We see this happening to the women in our lives or to ourselves. When women bear the weight of domestic work alone, there is less time for paid work or no time to rest. It makes us more likely to take up part-time jobs or even drop out of the work life altogether. It keeps us from being able to contribute the way we want to, both at home and outside in the world. Now, what if we did things differently? After all, the world is changing in new and unpredictable ways. The COVID pandemic has made us change our working habits wherever we are in the world. Now, isn't it time we change how we view domestic work as well? Women in India are experiencing at least a 30% increase in domestic workload now that outside hired help for domestic chores is not available. Children are home and elders need more support and attention. Something has to give. The world is going to need a lot from each of us to make it better and everyone's unique contributions will matter. What if we start to take control of our households to make the world at home a little better? What if we find a way to do better? After all, unpaid work is essential to us. It keeps our day-to-day -day lives running smoothly, keeps us healthy and can be immensely rewarding. What if we allow ourselves to be better as a couple, as a family unit, as a team? Team work at home. It's about sharing the load responsibly between us. It's a way to survive COVID together and come out stronger as a couple. But it's a lot more than creating a checklist to tick off during the pandemic. It's a lot more than one thing. It's an empowerment for all thing. It's an economic thing. It's a stress thing. It's a family thing. It's a how am I and how's my spouse and how's my child feeling at home thing. We can get through this and we can get through it stronger if we work together. So take charge of your home together, set your priorities as a couple and divide responsibilities, not just tasks. India has one of the worst gender imbalances when it comes to unpaid domestic work. Let's start by changing this in our own homes. There is no better time than now. Thanks team. Um, that was just a video that the Dahlberg team created in recognizing the increase in the unpaid care work burden and time poverty on women and girls during the COVID times. Um, we are now super excited for our next session, um, which is on gender-based violence. How can we report it? Uh, how can we respond to increased gender-based violence and support survivors post lockdown? This has really been a top of mind issue uh, for many during this pandemic. Increased rates of domestic violence, sexual violence has really threatened the lives of many women and girls. Um, in our last panel, we spoke about how many support systems like shelters have actually closed down, jails have become overcrowded, courts are not hearing cases. Um, and so this today uh, is no longer a, a discussion um, that we're having just amongst ourselves um, for intellectual curiosity, but a really important and urgent issue that uh, we must address. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our moderator, um, Pragya Tiwari, to kick us off. Pragya is a journalist and a writer for the last 15 years. Based in Delhi, she's been covering policy, politics, culture, and has written extensively recently on the impacts of COVID. Her work has been featured in numerous national and international publications, including the New York Times, Al Jazeera, Quint, Wire, The Hindu, Telegraph, Mint Lounge, and many more. So now over to you, Pragya. Thanks so much. I hope I'm audible. Um, and um, I would just 
like to kick off by um, introducing the topic uh, or rather the ambit of the conversation that we have planned over the next one hour. As all of you know already, the entire world right now is um, in the grips of an unprecedented pandemic and is in some or the other form of lockdown. A shadow pandemic has been on the rise parallelly that of increased number of cases of domestic violence and particularly against women. And this spike has only served to highlight the endemic nature of the serious problem of gender-based violence that we as a polity and as a society have failed to address successfully and comprehensively. So over the next one hour, we hope to be talking about the dimensions, manifestations, and scale of the problem, as well as some potential solutions for the near future and for the present time. But before I start, I would like to uh, welcome my co-panelists and uh, ask them to please introduce themselves uh, with a short, maybe less than one minute, quick introduction. Of course, you can Google them all. They've all done extensive work and read more about their work. Maybe we can start in alphabetical order. If Bishaka is here, maybe we can start with Bishaka. Sure. Hi. Thank you very much for inviting me to this. Uh, I'm Bishaka Datta. I live in Mumbai, where I run a nonprofit called Point of View. We work at the intersection of gender, sexuality, violence. We work online and offline. And I started many years back volunteering on a domestic violence helpline and nowadays work much more on digital violence. Great. Uh, um, is uh, Elsa, okay, I can see Elsa, so maybe she can go next. Good evening, everyone. My name is Elsa Marie De Silva, and I'm the founder and CEO of Red Dot Foundation. We have a crowd map called Safe City, where we crowdsource anonymous stories of sexual violence. And uh, I'm so glad we are talking about gender-based violence today at this conference. Great. Pradeep? Sorry, Pradeep, are you with us? Yes, I am. I, my video has been uh, shutting off, uh, having a mind of its own, unfortunately. So my apologies. Uh, hi, uh, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to be a part of this conversation. Um, but, Okay, there it is <laughs> now. Uh, thank you for be inviting me to be a part of this conversation. Uh, my name is uh, Pradeep. I'm with the Ford Foundation based here in Delhi. Uh, the Ford Foundation, you know, has always had gender as one of its primary focus areas for the longest time. Uh, this uh, last year, we decided to uh, narrow our focus on violence against women. So I am so glad that we're having this conversation because as far as we are concerned, um, you know, this is long overdue, these conversations and crisis like this just uh, puts a spotlight on uh, an issue as important as this. So thank you for inviting me. Finally, Yogita. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Yogita. And I'm really excited about this panel because I think it's a really important issue. And I'm glad we've got these fabulous panelists. Uh, so I work with an organization called Breakthrough that has been working on the issue of violence against women and girls for uh, 20 years now and we really come at it from a norms perspective and we really believe that everything that we see around ourselves and when you have crises like COVID-19 it really exacerbates you know, you're, what you're seeing is the underlying fissures really being exacerbated because this is what we've been conditioned to do per se and really looking forward to seeing what this conversation throws up. Excellent so without further ado I'm going to get this kick started but before I do um, for all of those of you who might have tuned in to listen to us, please participate in this conversation. Send us your comments. I will read them out if there is time, but I'll be more interested in taking your questions for our panelists. You can address a question to a particular panelist or to the panel in general, but please keep them coming and I'm going to try and keep time towards the end for some of your questions. Okay, so I'm going to begin with what I said in my introduction, that the spike in the number of domestic violence cases and it's um, morbidly fascinating that it's happened across the globe, whether it's China or Europe or America or India, there's been a spike in the number of reported uh, domestic violence cases. Um, 
of course, the cultural uh, nuances of this differ from continent to continent, uh, a country to country. But staying with India or South Asia for a minute, what might be the causes of this sort of spike, this exacerbation in violence at this point in time? Yogita, would you like to start? Yeah, sure. Uh, so violence in its, so I think when you have crises like COVID-19, you see spikes, but uh, one must also remember that domestic violence, there are already 30% of our women reported. So these are people who are actually saying that they're facing domestic violence. Uh, so there are women who, one in three women are already facing domestic violence without a crisis. When you put them into a, you know, a containment uh, situation where they're confined in a home with, with an abuser and they can't step out of their homes, then you're going to see a lot more, uh, you know, cases of domestic violence. Also, the fact that, uh, you know, their uh, violence is just so normalized. Breakthrough, for example, we work with adolescents in uh, Uttar Pradesh, for example, and uh, with, we work with about 500,000 adolescents. And uh, in one of our baselines that we did in Uttar Pradesh, we found that 70% of boys have been, you know, uh, recipients of such extreme violence that it's just so normalized. So if you ask a boy, how do you resolve a situation? It's always through violence. If you ask, a, you know, so if you ask a boy a question like, is it okay to hit a girl for a justified reason or for her parents to, to hit her? 50% say it's just fine. So what is going to happen when you have a crisis like the COVID-19, where you're in a confined space, where there's loss of livelihood, where you're frustrated, there's a lot of fear. The most vulnerable are going to get affected, which are usually the women and, and children in the home. So um, like I said, it's really all about the, the conversations we're already having and how normalized it is. Yeah. And of course, this is also a time, like you said, when women have lesser access to uh you know, to be able to step out for work or whatever, or reach out to support systems of any kind, whether they be neighbors or friends or family or whatever it is. So that makes matters much, much worse. And women live in areas where, you know, they, they don't have space, so they can't really oftentimes speak on the phone or really, you know, talk about their ordeal. And all of this sort of compounds to make <laughs> things worse. And just uh, very quickly before asking the other panelists to weigh in, I'd like uh, to um, bring up another statistic uh, that uh, supports what you were talking about. There was a National Family Health Survey that's done by the government of India that found that 52% of women thought that it was okay for their husbands to hit them. And only 42%, well, not only, but relatively only, 42% of men thought that it was okay um, for men to be hitting women. So it's interesting how deep-rooted uh, and normalized violence is in our culture, society, and of course, in our psychology. But before I move on, any other, any other thing that, Vishaka, would you like to talk about yeah. the spike in domestic and sexual violence at home? Sure, I actually want to think about it in two levels. So one is, you know, we talk about what's the root cause of domestic violence, and the root cause is patriarchy, and that remains across time, right? Uh, the subordination of women, men treating women as objects, blah, blah, private property, etc. What happens at certain moments, and we've seen this during droughts as well in India, during famine, etc., is that another factor pops up that works like a cofactor. So that's not really the root cause, but that sort of, you know, sort of comes into the root cause and then spikes it up. But I want to say that it's very important that we not think of like coronavirus as the main cause or the lockdown. We really need to think of patriarchy as the root and tackle that. Absolutely. Any other comments on this before I move on to my next question? Please, let's start with Elsa and then we'll take Pradeep. So to echo what Yogita and Bishaka said, I think it's unfortunate that uh, it's taken this pandemic, COVID-19, to expose what we've all known as a pandemic that has been there across time, like Bishaka said. Uh, the issue is really about um, having these conversations, about talking about it openly, because if you don't create an environment that is supportive for survivors to come forward, 
you know, we it'll always be what you described as a shadow pandemic, and maybe it slips through the cracks. But it's very, very important to have these conversations to make it non-taboo, so that we can find the solutions, and then we can address it at whatever level, whether it's education or legislation, or even in terms of resources. So that's just what I wanted to say in the introductory. Um, uh, part, but later I want to talk about how we've been addressing it. Um, we'll definitely come to talking about how to address this later on in in the long term view. But that's that's something to hold on to, Pradeep. Yeah, I'll just try to be brief. Uh, you know, I'd like to actually uh, politely disagree with what Elsa said. In that, uh, you know, she said that it took a crisis like this to highlight it. Actually, I disagree because I don't think it's been highlighted. I don't think anyone's talking about it. No one cares about it, honestly, in this crisis. We're finding from, you know, it's in spite of it one of being a, one of our core programs, and you know, we do track all data in India. No one, this is not even in the top five, ten uh, areas of people's concerns right now. Violence against women. That's the last thing on people's minds right now. So I disagree with Elsa that it's being highlighted now. It's not being highlighted now. No one's talking about it, which is very, very unfortunate. That's one. I think I, uh, think I will. I will. I tend to agree with Pradeep on that. I think I wish there was more awareness that this is actually a shadow pandemic. Sorry, did I cut you, Pradeep? Were you saying something else? Or? No, 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 no. Okay. I, no. I'm glad you agree. And just, just two other things. One is, you know, patriarchy has always been the bigger issue that we've been. Uh, you know, wanting to address, and I'm sure we'll speak about it later. So thanks to Bikasha for highlighting it. I just want to highlight, you know, two, 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 two uh, I guess, data points to your question. One is, uh, you know, when you ask why, you know, what's happening in COVID and what's being highlighted, or, you know, in this particular issue. So one is we got to realize that, see, we talk about violence, uh, you know, against women in public spaces. So you got to realize that public space is being redefined during this crisis, right? So that's something important for us to keep in mind because the public space that it used to exist before COVID is very different from the public space that exists today. Whether it be it more digital, be it food distribution centers, be it you know places where there's less crowd or whatever, public spaces are very, very uh, you know being redefined. So we got to keep that in mind when we think about violence against women. Uh, secondly, I think to what Yugita uh, was referring to about boys, you know, boys will be boys or whatever that excuse is. I guess see one of the things we have to address, and sadly, it's being um, you know, it's been, it, it's coming out in crisis like this, is this, is this cultural acceptability to say that, matlab, you know, this happens, it's okay. You know, this kind of violence against women, just like how certain things and, you know, whatever, uh, you know, alcohol abuse is also condoned or excuse saying, ha, when people are depressed of us, you know, alcohol to hota hi hai. I think we somehow have this cultural strong narrative within India that seems like, ito matlab hota hi hai. so what is there, you know, and, and these kind of crises actually, almost seems to uh, excuse that, which for me is, I think for us, that's what we got to really fight. So it's a bigger thing. It's not COVID, like, uh, like you know, uh, Bishaka said, but it's being uh, highlighted now to the extent that even though we are not talking about it, if we del delve into it, we're finding that people are saying it's okay. It's acceptable to do this because that's what happens when you're frustrated. And that's so, so not right. So it's a very deep cultural and systematic issue that we are fighting against here, which is very, very hard. Absolutely. And this is the thing about the house, what happens in the house, what happens in the house, what happens in the marriage, you know, that sort of attitude. And of course, just makes it more difficult for women to talk about things. And then, of course, women ask all kinds of questions. See, why is she talking? She wants attention, etc., etc. We'll come to that in a bit. But before I move on to, like Bishaka rightly said, that this we should not take away from the fact that this is an endemic problem. This is not a problem of the moment. It is perhaps just exacerbated in this moment. Um, but staying in this moment, are there sort of any emergency measures that you feel governments can take to um, address the fact that there is a spike at this point in time. I mean, just to give you an example, uh, we have, we are in different stages of lockdowns, depending on what zones and districts we are in. Um, and the definition of essential services does not include reaching out to a woman who might be in distress. So if you were to apply for a pass and, you know, and say that, well, I want to reach a friend who is in distress, that would definitely be rejected because it's not being explicitly recognized or the fact that we are anyway short of shelter homes, but there could be a possibility of converting some unused guest houses or uh, hotels to shelter homes, etc. So these are just top of my head examples, but 
any other ideas that governments could look towards as emergency stopgap measures to address the spike? Any of you could start. Can I go? Please. Okay. So um, imagine, I mean, if I were the prime minister, this is what I would do. I would first of all say that this is an emergency and I would put out like some sort of communication around it. Like imagine living in a world where the senior most members of government take this on and devote like even one minute of airtime to this saying, hey, this is the data that's coming in. This is a crime. It is a crime. Domestic violence is a crime under both criminal and civil laws in India. And that this will be severely punished and perhaps putting out a message at the same time saying, you know, if you know of anybody, if you're going through this, if you're seeing this, reach out. This is the number, a unified number across India. I mean, just that would, you know, push stuff up so much. Yeah. Absolutely agree. Any others, Yogita, and, else, any thoughts on that? And just like they did that with the coronavirus message, you know, every time you received a call, you first had to go through that message. So why not uh, use that technology to have some kind of reporting? Use WhatsApp. The National Commission for Women uh, instituted the WhatsApp helpline and, uh, and a special email ID. So why not have it at every state level and send regular messaging to lots of different people? Because we know that women use a lot of WhatsApp. They may not have access to, uh, you know, a lot of technology, but definitely um, and I feel these kind of messages are important because there's very low awareness also of what uh, causes, what is domestic violence, all the various facets of it. So having some Definitely kind of communication, yeah. having some kind of communication will draw people's attention to it. And then the next thing is really organizations. So when Pradeep says, yes, uh, it is actually not uh, really spoken about, I, I will also agree with that because early on at the, in, during the lockdown, we reached out to our corporates that we are working with. And we said, you know, uh, do you want to do a session on domestic violence and mental health? And they said, oh, no, you know, we don't want to touch this topic it's too heavy at this point in time. And I'm like, but at this point in time, this is what you should be, uh, you know, uh, promoting within your corporate, you know, like so that your women employees and through them, others can also get the message and the, uh, the numbers and, you know, all the other resources that are available to them. Yeah, so I think if they even start with the fact that the PWDVA Act is actually implemented, if you have protection officers who actually land up, if you have police officers who take FIRs, we had a case uh, recently where this girl, uh, you know, she, it was a domestic violence case and she contacted a colleague in office. Now this colleague uh, was, was like, you know, liaising with the protection officer trying to figure out. They finally landed up at the police station. The policeman there refuses to take the FIR. He's like, it's lockdown time. He can see visible bruises on the woman's face. He's still telling her, go back and adjust. Yeah, so we don't need emergency measures. We need the law to work. We need implementation of what is there. So uh, it's just how much of a priority are women and how much of a priority is violence against women for, for people, for, for our leaders, for, you know, how sensitized is, is police? Do judges, you know, uh, you hear of cases where judges tell women, you know, why don't you just go home and like, you know, make amends? So uh, it's, it's so widespread. So just let the law work to start with, then talk about emergency measures. No, absolutely, I agree. And this is possibly one of the many reasons why women are loath to report. There's gross underreporting everywhere in the world, but definitely in India and South Asia and attitudes of the police, your family, society, the fear of being judged. Uh, and of course, the lack of awareness, like Bishatha and Elsa pointed out, you know, the, the fact that people don't know where to call a lot of times and, you know, don't have the right kind of technology measures, etc. They don't know what to expect if they call all of these add to uh, why women don't often report domestic violence. But, you know, I want to move on. We don't have much time. So there's something I definitely want to address. And I think a lot of you have touched upon it in some way or the other is, is how we um, define violence against women or gender-based violence. Most often, the, the, the way in which it is thought about is physical violence. Like you said, visible bruises, 
uh, fracture, etc. You know, that's the face of domestic violence. Even when we see sort of um, messages which are, uh, you know, ads or whatever, advertorials or infomercials, you'll see a woman with a black eye, etc. But there are other kinds of violence. There's emotional abuse. There's, you know, sort of mental torture. There's confinement. I mean, the statistics on how many women, despite education and irrespective of class and caste, have to take permissions before they leave the house. There's deprivation. Um, there's sort of financial, um, you know, subjugation. So I just want to get a sense from all of you about what you feel uh, in terms of how, um, about the understanding of violence in the society. Any one of you could start. Pradeep, since you didn't, you know, would you like to start on this? Since you didn't, didn't sure. wait on the last one. <clears throat> sure. Um, you, you know, we don't define violence at all by physical violence alone, uh, you know, in our foundation. And some of the panelists here actually we've been fortunate to work with for some time also know that. Uh, so, you know, because again, I go to what Vishaka said, I think, you know, in coming back to patriarchy, see, a key difference is people only think of, sadly, you know, I think a lot of people who are very ignorant about this, and even those who do work in this, think about the physical violence itself, meaning, you know, it's the, it's the act. But there's a big difference between that and the fear of violence, right? The fear of violence is very different from a violence. The fear of violence, in, in our uh, opinion, is the one that needs to be addressed even as, as, as much as the violence itself. And whether that's manifests itself because of patriarchy or whatever, you know, other reasons, the fear of violence is what prevents women from, you know, being uh, uh, present in uh, public spaces, from contributing in the society, from being able to exercise their rights, from being able to, you know, access their bank accounts, from being able to, whatever, I can go on and on and on and on. And that's not at all understood. To your question about is it understood? Of course not. I don't think any of us here in the panel really clearly understand all of this because we all have different versions of what we think because I know sometimes when we have conversations with our partners, we'll say, okay, yeah, that's also there, but come on, let's not include that because if you also include that, 98% of women in India face violence. And so I guess the question is why not include that, right? Maybe let's be very honest about it. Maybe 98% of women in India do face violence, right? And it's, I think somehow our, uh, you know, our, I guess, even our way of defining that, okay, this, it starts with a very narrow circle of physical violence. And for Uspe, even in that physical violence, by the way, a lot of people would only qualify as certain things. Like, I think like this. many of you said, uh, you know, for, for sadly, you know, so, uh, you know, a family member hitting a woman would not even constitute even in that physical violence circle. You know, so it's, it's very poorly understood in India, very, very poorly, which is why I think the fear I have sometimes of starting with a very narrow definition is that's all, if at all we succeed, that's all that will remain with people. So I think we need to take a step back and all of us need to remind ourselves that violence, we, let's stop saying physical violence let's stop saying domestic violence because by doing that we're not helping the definition at all we're narrowing the definition to such an extent that people will then find some ways to go around it we need to take a step back and see that violence is much more than that it starts with you know, whether it's patriarchy the fear of violence for, for us i think as a foundation that's what we've been struggling with and that's the thing that we really want to help address in fact we should probably not even use the word women we should we should call it gender-based violence yes to include, uh, you know, transgenders and of course, transgender often at the worst kind of receiving end. Okay, any other thoughts on how we define um, violence? One point on, sorry, go ahead. Michelle. Go ahead, Yogita, after you. Yeah. Okay, just one point on violence. So, you know, in some of our programs, we, we spend almost a year working with women and with young girls to help them just identify what different forms of violence are because it's so hard coded that, you know, people will not talk to me. People will deprive me of nutrition. People will deprive me of money and say it's okay. People can have verbal abuse, which goes on 24 seven and that's okay. So for them to even identify that this is not okay, takes us almost a year. So it's actually one of the outputs we have in our, uh, you know, in our uh, results base uh, metrics that we put together. Shaka, sorry, you were saying. Similar to what Pradeep and Yogita said, you know, I think what's visible, but very severely visible is considered violence. Everything that's invisible is not considered. And I think it's very similar to the way people look at sexual violence, unfortunately, right? like even in cases of rape or sexual assault, 
there's a very, very limited understanding of what is sexual assault. And of course, the other thing we leave out, even though we are spending like all our time on digital devices, is digital violence. So, you know, I think we have to think of our bodies today, honestly, as like one hand on the mobile, one foot on the ground, and our body is everything that stretches in between. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that is something I want to address if we have time at length. So I will come back to you on that. Uh, but before I do, also, I wanted to talk to you because this is some, this is part of the work that you've done. And I was curious to know, you know, what kind of patterns of violence um, does sort of the anonymous data mapping that you've been doing and accounting that you've been doing, what kinds of violence, uh, patterns of violence have been revealed in that? So, you know, what Pradeep said is absolutely right, you know. Um, for example, we focused only on sexual violence in public spaces and we broke it down into different forms of it so that it was easy for people to identify and put in a way a label to their experience. And I can tell you that, you know, we've done workshops for like almost 30,000 people. And at the start of the workshop, we asked them, have you faced anything that constitutes as sexual violence? And they will say no. And when you go through the definitions, you go through the various laws that are in place in India and you ask them the same question, pretty much every person, I mean, when I say person, uh, mostly women uh, will put up their hand and some men as well, you know. So I would say that, you know, violence is part of our culture in a way. It's become so normalized at every level. And uh, when we talk about what's invisible, it's really showing up in the statistics. Take, for example, the femicide rates or, um, you know, women's participation in the labor force, the formal labor force, or you take the wage parity, whatever statistic you take, you know, the structural forms of that violence are manifested over there. What we've been doing is trying to help people identify and at least for a start, start to think about, okay, what, you know, what was this experience of mine and how did it translate to me as a person? Did it inhibit my movement? Did it inhibit uh, some of my potential? Did it inhibit my opportunities? And then trying to help them think about, uh, you know, the collection of the stories as a data set, identifying the patterns and trends at a local level and saying, what is it that I as an individual can do to change that? or as part of the community, change it or demand accountability from institutions. And what we found also has been useful is if I went with my single story, and we've seen that in Me Too, if I went with my story, it's really hard, first of all, to speak up. And when we do speak up, people still, you know, make me feel bad about it and make me want to prove my innocence. But when you can take an anonymous set, it doesn't have to be big data. It has to be relevant disaggregated data. It does get people's attention. It can be a starting point for dialogue and it does uh, help the larger community that you're part of to think about, okay, am I okay with it or do I want to change this? And that's, that's really what we've been able to do in several different communities, including college campuses and even in corporates. Okay. So, uh, you know, before I move on to um, the intersection between, you know, physical space violence and digital violence, I wanted to talk about another intersection. We all talked about patriarchy being the sort of uh, fountainhead of uh, a lot of different kinds of violence, gender-based violence. But uh, when it intersects with uh, class and particularly caste, it becomes, uh, in a, you know, a, an extremely toxic uh, mix, right? Because we uh, all know about cases of violence against Dalit women, et cetera, which are forms of violence against, you know, Dalit men. For example, the bodies of uh, Dalit women becoming the battleground uh, of, of uh, you know, power battles, political battles, social battles, battles along caste lines, et cetera. Um, it, it just, I, I wanted to get a sense from all of you of, you know, just mapping this entire sort of um, spectrum of violence and, you know, against women and the different intersections at which it, it uh, you know, it manifests itself. How daunting is that task? And um, have we as a society been able to do 
be very clear-eyed about how intersections operate when it comes to violence. Any of you could start. Vishaka, would you like to start? Or Pradeep, either of you? I mean, I feel like one of the, I'm gonna try and approach it from the justice lens, right? Like, of course, we know that, you know, it's your intersectional identity that can lead to particular forms of violence. And I think we really see this when women then go to the uh, justice system, you know, looking for redressal, right? So say if you're a Dalit woman and you go to a police station, the kind of stigma and discrimination that you face on top of the violence that you've already faced is very, very caste-based. And, you know, that kind of thing, I think another intersection we actually see is that uh, we work with a lot of women with disabilities. Again, there's a tendency somehow, I don't know why this is the case, but somehow like women with disabilities always get like put in some different silo, right? So there again, it's a problem. And then again, we've, uh, we work with a lot of women who are in sex work. And there, there's a different problem because, you know, they're just not believed at all. Like it's just assumed that say, a woman who's in sex work can't be raped. And again, there's stigma and discrimination. So very much that intersectional identity really affects not just the kind of violence, but really the kind of remedy that women get or trans people. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, forget about uh, sex workers. In India, the law believes that if you're married, you can't be raped by your husband. So, I mean, we have a long way to go. Sorry, Pradeep, you were saying something? Or you? Yeah, no, yeah, no, I, I, I couldn't agree more, you know. It's, it's just on a lighter way to start with. Uh, you know, if I had a penny for every time we try to figure out the intersectionalities that exist, I think I would have made a lot of money by now. You know, because the intersectionalities, I think, is, is a hot topic overall in the gender thing. And we're just realizing, again, so this is an amazing, um, you know, this this area of work, gender, is one of those things where even those, and I started off by saying that, for those of us organizations, individuals, uh, you know, who've been working on it for so long, we're always learning new things. We're always discovering new things, right? And coming to intersectionality, I think in a country like India, for all the, you know, how complex it is, whether it's caste and, uh, you know, religion and geography and you know, class and all that, it, it becomes a nightmare to get the data that you suggested that do we have. It, it is a very, very daunting task. So let me tell you that. Having said that, I don't think we see any other way out. We have to consider intersectionality. You know, one intersectionality that we discovered, for example, this year that we were not even aware of, you know, to talk about things that you learn is age, right? And by age, what I mean is young women, and look, all of us here are different age groups, both our approaches to what we think violence is, our definition to what Yogita said, and even our way, solutions for uh, uh, violence is very different depending on, you know, how old you are or how young you are, even as a woman. And we didn't know that. We didn't have enough data on that as we started this program. And when we brought together these wonderful people who were working in this, we were, we were shocked by, oh my God, we didn't realize this. That's, so, the, so where is that intersectionality? How does that fit in? Right? And I'm talking only about, let's say, you know, you, you, you focus it, narrow it down to women. Within women, you narrow it down to middle class. Within, I mean, you take as many commonalities as possible. But still, if there's a difference of age, it is like, it is like, uh, it's, it's like the earth and whatever. Like, you know, it's so different. It's like day and night. So it, that's how complicated the intersectionality is, I guess. Uh, but having said that, you know, that's not an excuse that we shouldn't look at it. But I'm just saying that, you know, for us, we are, um, you know, we are, uh, you know, our eyes and ears are always open to this, but we're just learning every day, I guess is what I'm saying. Because I don't think we have a handle on it at all. No, fair enough. Any any comments, Yogita, Elsa, before I move on to the next question? No, I think uh, Pradeep and Vishaka covered it. Just one small statistic that Dalit women on an average less than 1% ever get any kind of conviction for a sexual assault. I mean, it's that the justice system is that weighed against them. So, you know, you have to look at intersectionality. And usually when you say domestic violence, you imagine vast swathes of, you know, uniform women. That's not the case. So, um, Fair enough. Okay, I just want to quickly move on to, um, you know, we were talking about the digital space and the physical space. Uh, obviously, I'd like to start with you, Bishaka, but I'm hoping to get all of you to comment on this. Um, I, I would probably like to start with, um, uh, perhaps most of you are aware of a conversational topic, a uh, de uh, debate that's been taking place lately, which is the boys' locker room scandal. 
where we've seen, for those of you who might not be aware, um, underage, that's minor boys and in some cases, you know, just, just having conversations uh, about women's bodies in uh, lewd ways in, uh, and uh, talking about um, abusing women's bodies, kidnapping. Of course, there's some confusion. Apparently, there was a woman who, you know, pretended to be a guy. But the thing here is, it's again brought to fore the fact that, you know, all over, and this is not the dark web, it's all over the internet, you have these sort of uh, spaces where, um, you know, this sort of misogyny, this, this, uh, this sort of, uh, um, you know, violent conversations about women and their bodies uh, freely take place. So I just wanted to get, and of course, then there is the other end of the spectrum where, you know, people like myself who are journalists, we, it's so normalized that every time I put out an article on Twitter, you know, I'll get attacked by trolls. But of course, it's interesting that the only abuse I'll get is sort of misogynistic sexual abuse um, rather than, you know, I, I mean, that's so different from how they abuse men who put out similar articles. So I just wanted to get a sense of how we should begin to wrap our heads around what the internet has provided when it comes to uh, these sorts of behaviors and how can we even begin to address it? Okay, so I think one of the things is, I think we have to really get away from hierarchies of violence, right? In an age where part of our body is physical, part of our body is physical, but sort of interacting with the digital like we are now, and part of our body is really digital in the forms of, you know, images, words, etc. It really doesn't make sense any longer to say that, oh, you know, stuff that happens to your physical body is more important than stuff that happens to your digital body. I think we have to accept that this is an age where we cannot say any longer that sticks and stones may my bones, but words can never hurt me or whatever, right? Words and images are the prime weapons of digital violence in many forms from the boys locker room regardless of the confusion around who said it etc we know that this is the kind of misogynistic conversation that takes place in a, you know many many digital locker rooms let's say and physical of course and i think we have to just reframe our heads and you know sort of say that if you are the person who's experiencing this kind of shit stream you know from morning to night on your feed the kind of emotional, mental, psychological health consequences. You know, it's totally like a form of violence. So that's what I want, like sort of this hierarchy to end and sort of stop saying, you know, like this is more important. This is, it's all important to the person who experiences it. Any uh, thoughts on this, Elsa and Yogita? I don't have much time and I do want to move on, but any quick thoughts on this would be very welcome. Yeah, I agree with Bishaka that, uh, you know, especially the digital, we cannot treat it as separate. I think today um, the digital space is as, as, you know, similar to the physical space. And for somebody to, in fact, and I would think it's more dangerous over there because people are actually saying things like, I will rape you, which they may not necessarily say on your face in the physical world. So we have to take those words very uh, seriously because those are threats. And uh, I think, um, you know, we should call them out and we should, uh, you know, insist on uh, severe punishment uh, because it's not a matter of law. We have the laws in India. It's about implementation of these laws and also education right from a very early age. Uh, how do we make sure that people know that, you know, um, that this kind of behavior is totally inappropriate? If this is, you know, we are in 2020 and we should not be actually discussing this in a way. But, uh, you know, we continue to face this form of violence and many other forms of violence, you know. So I think, um, yeah, we have to treat it not as separate, but as part of the larger group of violence. Okay, so I have time for just one final question before I take some questions from the audience. And this is going to be a big one. So I want all of you to equally try and weigh in. 
um, and this is about you know what would be there are uh, you know there are institutional changes that we need to be able to address this like Yogita has pointed out or Gashaka has pointed out which is criminal justice system the police the courts etc the legal uh, interventions that we need in terms of laws better laws etc there's educational interventions that we need that Elsa was just talking about and of course there's social interventions that we need that some of which Pradeep highlighted so under all these broad heads, there's so much that is to be done. I would just like to get a sort of personal wish list from all of you, not maybe an exhaustive list, but what is topmost on your personal wish list of changes that we can make or we should be making to make things better in the present and in the future. I'll start with you, Yogita. So for, for, for me, I think we always come at it from a norm space and it really needs to like the way we bring up our children, the kind of conditioning we give them, the way boys look at girls, the way, you know, fathers mod role model with, with mothers for children, that has to change. And really we need a, like a transformation of mindsets at a really large scale. You can put in every institution, you can put in every judicial system. You're not going to change how people think and what they do at home unless you have, you know, large scale norm change and you stop like this whole concept of violence being okay and violence being justified and you know women being the recipients of it at the end of it it has to stop and it has to be unacceptable so yeah Pradeep would you like to come in sorry I can't hear you at this moment no I said my apologies my two daughters are hovering around me which is why I've had to turn off and on the video well not a bad thing for them to hear this They'll be proud. Yeah, no, I, I, no, believe me, I spend all my time with them on this only, so they're tired of me hearing about this. No, but I, I do, and I think I was going to say that's one of the things that all of us should do, I think, is, is you know. No, but, but you know, I, I'll just uh, be brief and say, uh, uh, you know, be easy on myself by just laying out what is it that has a foundation that we're focusing on. See, there's, you know, we, we're kind of looking at it three phases and three categories almost. Our most uh, immediate um, uh, focus is on organizations that are directly involved in these relief efforts around these issues that uh, gender violence is facing. So I think for us, whether you call it a wish list or what is it that we have, whether it's a roadmap. So we, you know, we're currently focusing on organizations that are in some way, which actually, by the way, are very few involved in response efforts, right? That's one category. The second category of organizations are organizations that work on uh, developing these training and capacity building efforts for responses to other organizations and all, right? Which unfortunately, again, also there, there are not too many. And those organizations themselves are facing challenges, as you can imagine, because of lockdown and all of that. So that's the second category of organizations that we would like to continue to work on. So these organizations, again, are those that are focused on the capacity building and training efforts for other organizations that work on response and everything, you know, related to violence. And then the third category of organizations, which are very important to us, and which unfortunately, you know, we've had to um, slow down on, uh, but I think it's very, very important. Are those organizations, whether it's communities uh, or movements or, you know, uh, networks that have worked all these years on really, you know, taking the women's, uh, these narratives and movements to a certain place. So we don't want the gains that has been achieved by these networks and communities and movements to go away. Unfortunately, that's taking a backseat now because of the category one and category two, like a set of organizations, but we're very mindful that those organizations, those conversations, the category of those organizations that have been working for years and decades, you know, on chipping away to make some gains should also not be neglected. So for us, it's those three pronged approach, I guess, whether it's in series or parallel, we don't really know because ideally we would like to do all of it and we'd like to do all of it now. But as we know, that's not realistic. Excellent. Elsa? Elsa, are you with us? You're muted trying to unmute yeah so i think education at all levels so the norms based uh, education that yogita was talking about should be mandatory in all schools and similarly in all organizations as well why is it so difficult to talk about uh, different forms of uh, violence even if we are talking about sexual harassment at the workplace for example so i think at every level including uh, with uh, institutions like the police etc there should be uh, education uh, the second one is make it easy for people to report. Um, why? Because if you don't have the data, you won't be able to, uh, you know, efficiently deploy your resources, both human and financial. 
So it's very important. And the third is to have a gender sensitive approach in all your policy making. So I think that's very critical because, uh, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, somebody who's facing this violence, it is up to that person to make that choice, whether they want to leave the home, whether they want to leave that relationship, whether they want, you know, what is it, whatever they want to do, that should be that person's choice, but it should be a, an informed choice where, where she has all the information and the surrounding environment should be supportive of it. So I think uh, those are my three top uh, interventions. Excellent. We'll end with you, Bishaka. Okay, very quickly, my top two at this moment, one would be, you know, ensuring that people know they can also get counseling. It's everybody is not comfortable reporting, but everybody needs help like dealing, coping with violence, right? Second is, of course, like reporting what's called tone at the top, politically indicate that this is important. And long term, I think really it's culture change, norm change, changing our headspace. Okay, so now um, I just have 10 minutes and we have loads of questions. Uh, the organizers have, um, you know, chosen, picked a couple of questions and sent them my way. So those of you who are listening in and I might not be able to take your questions, I'm sorry, I haven't actually been able to multitask and do this while reading your questions. So I'll start with this. Um, okay, so this is from Archana Ria uh, Vikraman who says, this is for everybody, how do we combat the root of this violence, which is patriarchy, how to build sensitivity among people? I feel like this was already addressed. We talked about norm changes, Elsa talked about um, education, Yogita talked about families and you know the roles that they play. Pradeep also sort of addressed it. Is there anything you'd like to add on that? Or if you feel like we've more or less covered it, I can move on to the next question. Anything from anyone? Okay. Um, okay. What so I'd like to add is that, you know, often we are looking at it as a woman's issue and this is not a woman's issue. This is a societal issue and it's high time we looked at it like that. So everybody in society has a role to play in ending this. Absolutely agree. Couldn't agree more. When we speak about domestic violence, uh, is it limited to physical and sexual abuse or even mental abuse and systemic misogyny? I think we talked about that as well. Um, okay. Uh, this one is to you, Bishaka. You've already talked about digital violence, but uh, just wanted to get a sense of, of course, the times and our that we spend on online has gone up due to lockdown and so has our dependence on being online. Have you noticed any patterns in terms of change where, uh, or spike or whatever in terms of digital abuse in this time? I mean, quite honestly, I am trying to limit my social media time to stay sane and stuff like that. So I'm not tracking patterns to be honest, but you know, we are seeing, for example, even like, the combination of, you know, Corona and Islamophobia, that kind of thing. The whole boys locker room has broken right now, which of course begs the underlying question of consent, which is always sort of hovering below all this kind of stuff, right? Uh, so what I would say is that I don't know about the numbers, etc. But I would say that at a time when we are already under sort of such a cloud and we're trying so hard to sort of protect our mental and emotional health that, you know, everything is falls that much more deeply. And those word and image violations like harm us that much more. So I feel like in that sense, it's sort of everything is amplified. Every emotion is exaggerated. And so we can't really, you know, really underplay the, impact of things that affect our emotional and mental health and all forms of digital violence do that to be honest yeah okay um so next question is what actions can small ngos take with limited resources to help address this shadow pandemic uh, pradeep would you like to talk about this sure see i think you know i i don't know where this is coming from but whether you're small or large or medium i'm hoping the ngo has a very clear mission 
on what is it that it wants to do and what, what outcome it plans to achieve. So I would say you just need to continue doing that, uh, right? So I think there's nothing to do with the size of the NGO, as we all know. I mean, all of us have, you know, different, um, you know, whatever resources that are at, at, at our disposal. I think you should not be looking at yourself as, you know, whether you're small or big, but hopefully you have a very strong mission. Like you do have, you know, you're now outcome driven. And if not, I would say reach out to other organizations or individuals who can help you maybe define or redefine that vision. I almost feel that the, this question is maybe coming from an organization or individuals who don't have the clarity of the vision or the outcome of what they really want to do. And maybe the question to ask is that and not the size of the organization. I completely agree. And in fact, maybe what small NGOs have in, in terms of assets, they may not have resources, but what they have instead perhaps is a more sort of local understanding and perhaps more access to, because data is such a lack of data, such a pandemic in itself in this country, more sort of understanding of communities, et cetera. Uh, and they can sort of uh, leverage that to be able to identify people who might need help, uh, give them access to information, you know, empower them in other ways, maybe women who've been uh, who've lost their livelihood and have suddenly don't have any kind of financial resources, maybe they can identify them. So perhaps that's something to think about. Anything else that any of you can want I, to add before I move on? Okay, can I just pitch in? So, you know, we work with a lot of grassroots nonprofits and we've done digital literacy trainings with them and sort of taught them how to make these cool feminist forwards on WhatsApp and stuff like that, right? What's really interesting is at this moment, even if they live in rural areas and they're tiny or whatever, they're using WhatsApp, so the so all of them can't go out because of lockdown, right? So they will collect cases of domestic violence through WhatsApp, and then one person is designated to go and report it to the cops or to like be in touch with the cops. So it's interesting that NGOs are setting up little, little networks and trying to deal with this, even though physical mobility is affected. Okay, the next question, which is sort of, sorry, did I, did Yogita, Elsa, anything that you'd like to add to this? I would uh, emphasize the power of uh, collaboration, whether you're a small NGO or a big NGO, we are two, you know, individually, uh, no organization is going to be able to solve this problem. So if you don't work in this space, then collaborate because there's enough of material out there uh, that can help you implement it in your community. So at least start the conversation within your community about uh, domestic violence or any other forms of violence and uh, link them up to resources that uh, are existing. So for example, we uh, work closely with Majlis for legal aid in Bombay and we work with several other organizations for mental health counseling. So, you know, we know where our niche is and uh, we put together a bigger program with many different organizations. Okay, next question which is sort of related is uh, what can we as individuals with very limited powers uh, uh, do to support women who are undergoing abuse? I'm going to start. One very easy thing is, I'll come to you Yogita first, but one very easy thing is if you have maids working for you or women working for you in any way, do not cut their salaries, do not take away their salaries at this point in time because that is that much of financial independence is crucial for them to be able to withstand and walk out in case they are facing domestic abuse. And the second thing I would say is that it is very, very difficult for women who are facing abuse to report it, to talk about it and to escape it. Uh, women typically leave many, many times and then they tend to come back. So if you know people who are facing abuse, try and be really non-judgmental about it as much as you can and be supportive and do not get sort of frustrated that they are, they are stuck in a, in a warp that they are not being able to get out of. It's easier said than done. Sorry, Yogita. So I think um, what anybody can do as an individual is really to be resp a responsible bystander. You can really, uh, you can report it, you can intervene, you can uh, break through, run, ran this campaign called Belvija for the longest time, which really said that if you hear violence around you, you go and ring the bell and it could be for something as stupid as do you have a glass of milk in your house or whatever, but you dissipate the violence in that moment. I think the acknowledgement by people that when you hear violence around you, it is my problem also. It is not just the problem of the person or the family. That needs to happen with every individual in the country. And that's when change really begins. 
Okay, uh, sorry, I think I've been told that I have to, sorry, is there anyone else who'd like to add? I've just been told, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm distracted, this kind of talking to you guys, which I get completely lost with, and then the a series of instructions I keep repeating on, uh, keep getting on chat. Anything else that anyone would like to add to this? Now, I, I would say, you know, just if, if someone wants to easily remember, because people love acronyms on what as an individual you can do, is, is the three P's, you know, is, is practice it yourself, meaning that, you know, don't, you know, obviously uh, you know, practice it yourself. The second is preach it. So the second P is preach it, meaning anyone, you know, and anyone and everyone you have access to, preach it to them. And the third is prevent it when you see it, right? So I would say those are the three things that you need to do yourself, which I think all three people don't do. You know, and, and it's hard. It's not as easy as it sounds. But those are the three P's. I think if everyone decides to do it themselves, then that's a very good start. Okay, so there was one more question by Ria Chavla. She was asking, are punitive actions the only ones that will stop such instances from happening in the future? She was talking particularly about boys' locker room, but I feel like we've already addressed that by talking about other kinds of interventions that are equally important. And I am told that is all the time that I have. Thank you very much, guys, for talking to me. I wish I could hear you guys uh, for much, much longer, but I've, I've been told I have to wrap up. So thanks very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. That was fantastic. Um, thanks everyone for joining us in this really important conversation. Uh, thank you to the panelists for really shedding light on this shadow pandemic behind uh, COVID, which is gender-based violence. Um, and thanks Pragya, I think she just dropped off, but uh, I think she did such a wonderful job of weaving in all these different perspectives together. Um, we're gonna take a quick one or two minute break and we'll reconvene very shortly. Um, and move right into the next panel on investing in girls. During the lockdown, there has been a sharp increase in the number of domestic violence cases. To all the men we say, now is the time to stand up against this violence. To all the women we say, now is the time to stand up and break your silence. If you are a witness to domestic violence in your home, please report. If you're a witness to domestic violence in your neighborhood, report it. If you're a survivor of domestic violence, report it. Report it. Report it. Report it. Report it. Let's put a lockdown on domestic violence. Let us put a lockdown on domestic violence. Let's put a lockdown on domestic violence. Let's put a lockdown on domestic violence. During the lockdown, there has been a sharp increase in the number of domestic violence cases. To all the men we say, now is the time to stand up against this violence. To all the women we say, now is the time to stand up and break your silence. If you are a witness to domestic violence in your home, please report. If you are a witness to domestic violence in your neighborhood, report it. If you are a survivor of domestic violence, report it. Report it. Report it. Report it. Report it. Let's put a lockdown on domestic violence. Let us put a lockdown on domestic violence. Let's put a lockdown on domestic violence. Let's put a lockdown on domestic violence.